Okay, so it looks like we are, we are all here. Uh, welcome to the, the closing session of the, uh, this Arctic Energy Summit. Um, it's great to see so many uh, new friends uh, after three days of deliberations um, and fairly intense uh, working sessions. Uh, hopefully you know everybody else uh, who's here um, and that uh, you have uh, had a good chance to both connect as professionals uh, and bond as uh, friends. Um, I'm very pleased with the, with the level of dedication uh, that each of you have approached this topic. Um, uh, as you have discovered and, and probably knew coming in, uh, Arctic energy is a, a complex and, and multi-faceted uh, topic, um, but hopefully these three themes of richness, responsibility, and resilience have helped frame uh, for you uh, the discussions. Uh, it seemed that they provided a, uh, a good thread throughout. Um, and in this closing session, uh, we will uh, build our findings uh, based on those themes. So. Uh, you will have uh, just participated in a, some small work sessions uh, just prior to this. And I am going to invite up the three chairs of those sessions uh, one at a time to report out on their takeaways. Um, and these takeaways uh, will then um, uh, build the, uh, be the starting point for the final report uh, which will be delivered to uh, the Sustainable Development Working Group of the Arctic Council in a week's time, uh, which uh, gives me not a lot of time to finalize this. But uh, um, uh, very glad to, uh, to be able to deliver this uh, from here to, to them um, uh, so tangibly. Um, at, at this point, I want to bring up uh, Jean-Vivre Carr uh, from the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. AANDC, uh, who has replaced John Payne uh, as the session chair uh, for richness. I, I know that uh, uh, they had a rich discussion, and uh, rich. I will, uh, yeah, it's rich. Um, uh, I will leave it to her to report out on uh, what they found. Yeah. Thanks, Niels. I hate the lights up here. I complained about that last time. I'm going to complain about it again. Um, Okay, so we did have a very rich discussion, I would say, uh, and, and lively, and I thank the participants who joined. I think um, I was quite happy with the engagement, and I certainly didn't feel like I had to draw anything out. I think everything came out in quite a fluid motion, so that was quite satisfying. Um, immediately, we, we discussed when we started our conversation, um, what, what do we mean by richness? Um, and even... Before that, so even before the immediate conversation, I posed to the panel what I understood uh, Nils's question to be, and that is, what is our what are the perspectives that we gleaned from this event um, as they relate to richness, um, and as richness relates to energy issues in the Arctic? So that was essentially our, that was our question. Um, so we did immediately start talking about types of richness. Um, and and I suppose a little bit to my surprise, although probably stupidly from my part, um, we immediately started talking about, about richness of energy reserves, richness of resources, and that's both the, the richness of petroleum resources but also alternative um, energy uh, resources and renewable energy. Um, but we did acknowledge that uh, there are different types of richness. So there's this type of resource richness, but there's um, or energy richness, if you will, um, also an ecological richness or an ecosystem richness, as well as a sociocultural uh, richness, and that there are scales to this richness that need to be considered, and that the interpretation of richness might vary by scale. So um, that of course ranges as does the theme of this the summit from local all the way up to global uh, and back down again. Um, we also acknowledge that the Arctic Council has done a lot of work looking at different types of richness in different ways and um, I had the benefit of sitting in a workshop this morning that was talking about both the Arctic Human Development Report uh, and the predecessors to that or the intermediary steps uh, leading up to the second Arctic Human De Development Report um, as well as the Arctic bio Biodiversity Assessment um, produced by two different working groups. Um, and I know from my day job that uh, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program has done a lot of work on an oil and gas assessment from a few years ago. 
Um, what seemed to be a gap in that, and this is where you can start to guess where this discussion headed, is is an overview or, or a look at at alternative uh, energy sources and alternative uh, alternative resources. So if we were to recommend something to the Sustainable Development Working Group, um, it would be that there be a survey of renewable energy or alternative uh, energy sources, um, and, and that we survey this against what the value is or um, what, what, yeah, what the value is of these resources to the different scales, so to the, from the local scale up to the global scale. Of course, to do that, you'd need to develop metrics um, to actually be able to measure, I mean, let's put aside the metrics that you need to actually be able to measure the richness of these energy sources, uh, alternative energy sources. You'd need to develop metrics um, to develop um, the real value of these sources. And we talked about a number of different metrics um, or, or things that need to be considered. Things um, about distance to market, the technical feasibility of actually recovering the energy from these, these resources, um, the ability to transmit or store the resources, um, the local needs and the values um, for these alternative energy sources uh, and how that relates to both national and global needs and perhaps values. Um, and in that, in that local context, you need to consider the social metrics, and we talked about um, relative income that is spent on energy reserves. Um, we talked about the balance between human health and energy sources um, and any energy richness. Um, we we um, also talked about using um, metrics that are fairly well standardized when you're looking at hydrocarbon reserves. Um, in terms of in terms of trying to quantify and demonstrate the type of uh, reserves that we're talking about for alternative fuels, and that's coming up with decent in-place estimates, um, identifying what is actually technically recoverable, and and we acknowledge that that is a, a dynamic uh, as as technology is continually continually evol evolving. That's a dynamic. Um, uh, it's hard to hard to pinpoint that, but nevertheless, with what we know now, what is technologically recoverable, as well as what's economically recoverable, ultimately what's economically recoverable. Um, I think um, it, once we actually pull this together, and the hope is that a lot of this information actually already exists. Um, there's a, some reticence, there was some res reticence within the group that we discussed that was talking about this um, to produce another 800, 900 page report that takes four or five years to develop. Um, uh, that couldn't we just pull this from existing information? I, and I, I don't have the knowledge, and I'm not sure that we all had the knowledge at the table. There's some thought that maybe um, at the at national levels a lot of this information exists and it's collating it. Um, but we do absolutely have to overlay what we learn about alternative energies with our conservation values, and so information that comes out of documents like the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment and, and the sociocultural conservation values, such as through the Human Development Report. Um, we thought it would be of real value to review best practices, in, um, uh, including things like what we've learned a lot about this week um, of value-added um, uh, exports for countries such as Iceland exporting their energy through aluminum. Um, and, and we want to identify any potential co-benefits or opportunities of accessing these alternative fuels uh, so that we can build local solutions in conjunction with national and global investments. We talked a little bit about um, the potential for pr public-private partnerships uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> we had a bit of a discussion about Arctic Energy Fund or funds and uh, quickly acknowledged that an international Arctic Energy Fund where we uh, create this fund that will encourage local development is probably impractical. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the outcomes of such an overview of alternative energy fuels or just the energy picture, richness picture, uh, panarctically might be to encourage the development of national and possibly binational funds, uh, but we didn't delve too deeply into that because I think there was a sense that uh, some, some uh, skepticism that, that we could actually make that work. Um, I, think, um, I think the rest of my notes are illegible. <laughs> and I think I started to smell coffee. <laughs> um, so I, I hope that for the folks who are at the table that you feel that I more or less captured what we, um, what we spoke about. Um, if I've missed a point, I, I, um, I'm sorry. Uh, but, but it was certainly a fun conversation, and, and thanks.
Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, so next, uh, and remember at the beginning of uh, the summit, I had uh, posited, I guess, a, uh, um, that uh, richness plus responsibility equals resilience. And uh, uh, it'll be interesting for me to see how that uh, plays out and uh, uh, whether my uh, equation makes sense. Um, and so next up, uh, I want to invite Joan uh, Nyman Larson. Uh, to talk about responsibility and, and how do we approach uh, as, as uh, people and as Arctic peoples uh, this, this richness that we have. Joan? That was certainly a very rich reporting that we just got. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I will be able to capture such, um, I have been able to capture all those uh, details or uh, such details in the session we had. We had uh, a very quick uh, brainstorming uh, session. It was somewhat fragmentary because uh, we just discussed um, all kinds of um, possible proposals rather than focusing in on, a, on, in on a couple of areas. Now I will try and review those points here for you. Um, but first, as a, as a point of departure, uh, we uh, briefly looked at um, you know, why we need to discuss uh, responsibility. Uh, and of course, uh, as we have heard uh, throughout this conference, uh, there is this renewed interest in the Arctic. We also uh, have an Arctic region that is very vulnerable. Um, and uh, we have a very diverse uh, region in terms of peoples, cultures, and societies. Uh, with uh, a population of 10, uh, 4 million people, of which 10% are indigenous. This also means that uh, we have a region with different stakeholder interests uh, that need to be taken into consideration in discussing the topic of responsibility. And we acknowledged uh, from the beginning of, of our discussion that extractive industries or resource development in the Arctic would not be able to operate uh, if the operations must be done free of risk. So we acknowledge that there will be always an element of risk. Uh, and this presents, of course, many challenges. Uh, so we need to look at uh, what are the benefits and what are the costs um, uh, of different initiatives uh, and weigh, those, weigh the risks. Uh, and that also leads us to, to consider who defines acceptable levels of risks. So I think that was sort of our point, uh, point of departure. Uh, and then we got into um, reviewing different proposals, uh, and that was really just more of a brainstorming um, hour, uh, looking at, at all kinds of uh, interesting and innovative ideas. Um, so uh, one uh, proposal that was put forward was to review uh, safety protocols and to have a discussion about agreement of safety protocols across the Arctic um, to look at who pays the cost of environmental impacts, uh, who are the ones who should be taking the resp responsibility, and then to look at uh, common safety protocols um, for, uh, for the circumpolar region in general, uh, including um, best management practices. Um, and here it was noted that uh, uh, there, there are operations out there um, that have no money to, to implement um, a proper safety, uh, safety standards. Um, so we really need a, a review of a safe, safe, um, safety protocols um, within, within the framework of, uh, of the Arctic Council. And in this context, uh, we should also be looking at um, comparing uh, regulatory regimes uh, there are two kinds of approaches um, that we could uh, be uh, reviewing, uh, both a performance-based approach and a prescriptive-based approach, uh, and analyze the marriage of these two different approaches and maybe look at some uh, harmonization. Um, then we, uh, we looked at the lack of industry involvement uh, in discussions at the level of the Arctic Council, and I think that was... Um, noted to be a, a very uh, important point made because uh, here we have an energy summit with many representatives from industry. Uh, but if we, um, and, and we have been discussing a lot of important issues uh, that, that require 
you know, uh, decision making. Yet, uh, uh, when we look at the Arctic Council, uh, who sits around the table, it's a representative of member states, uh, permanent participants, uh, scientific organizations, and then we have the observer states. Uh, but really don't have representatives from industry there. Uh, so this was a, an important point um, that was stressed a few times throughout our, our discussion. Uh, and um, uh, in this context, we, would, um, uh, we should consider including uh, environmental NGOs uh, in the discussions at the level of the Arctic Council, industry, both from shipping and fisheries, etc. cetera. Um, and then, um, in general, strengthening uh, business engagement uh, in, discussion, in discussions uh, at the Arctic Council. Um, then it was also noted that uh, currently there is a proposal for a circumpolar business forum. Um, and uh, one of our uh, participants in our discussion suggested that uh, we could um, suggest an analysis or review of how inclusive uh, that circumpolar business, business forum um, is uh, a, a business forum is is planned to be. Um, then we also discussed the need for a discussion on shipping in the Arctic Ocean. Um, participants uh, were stressing uh, concerns over accidents in the Arctic Ocean, and in particular um, discussions of um, high, the high sea area. Um, what are the regulatory uh, frameworks uh, in connection with the high sea area? Um, it was also noted that there, are, there is traffic passing through some areas that are not bound by regulatory framework. Um, and then the question was raised, who is responsible in, in these cases? Um, so we, we need, or we were, we were suggesting that um, uh, one, one need uh, would be to, to look at the regulatory regimes in place. Uh, and the best practices. Uh, also, uh, it was mentioned in our discussion um, uh, that uh, PEMI, uh, uh, the Pro Protection of Arctic Marine Environments, um, uh, is studying um, the high seas uh, of the Arctic Ocean and that, that their study uh, could be expanded uh, to, to other areas. Um, then also a suggestion was made um, to, to have more discussion about renewable energy sources, uh, again at the level of the Arctic Council, um, because a lot of our discussion here um, has been about um, non-renewable energy, oil and gas, uh, but maybe uh, there could be more of a discussion about um, the feasibility of uh, uh, renewable sources of energy uh, at a more broad scale within the Arctic region uh, and maybe a, an analysis of what we can learn from the Arctic nations who make use of renewable energy such as Iceland now that we are here. So, um, so I think that that was uh, uh, certainly a proposal that was very welcomed by the group. And then uh, there was also some talk about um, the need to include, uh, to make more use of uh, permanent observers um, in discussions uh, at the Council on, on these issues of responsibility, um, uh, because uh, we, we might be, be able to learn, uh, uh, learn from uh, the lessons uh, that a permanent observers uh, can bring to the table. Um, then there was also some more sort of long-term visions, and I think that was also to try and shake up the discussions uh, in our group. So uh, one proposal for sort of a more long-term vision was, uh, you know, why not to consider maybe um, 50 or 100 years from now some kind of federation of Arctic states? Um, uh, and that would, would, would create a forum um, to help safeguard our environment and our communities. Uh, and the point here was made that we need to investigate not only um, what can happen um, in terms of our environment and our societies and cultures over the short term, but also over the long term. So a long term vision might be to, cons uh, to think in terms of some kind of federation or, or, Arctic, uh, or Arctic country. Um, 
Then uh, we also look sp uh, more specifically at tourism, and the point was made that there is limited or no uh, real sort of reg regulatory framework in place there, not, or at least not uh, uh, similar to what we see in, in terms of the oil and gas sector. Um, uh, so um, there was a, a suggestion for, for more analysis there. Uh, and then in the context of that, um, also to, to work on the actual implementation of the search and rescue agreement um, of the Arctic Council, because now it has been tabled and uh, agreed on, uh, but we also need to take the next step of actually implementing it. Um, so that was, that was a concrete example as well. Um, then I guess also here in terms of sort of the more long-term vision, I, I mentioned the, 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 the proposal of a, an Arctic Federation just earlier. Uh, another similar long-term vision was that of a possible Arctic Union akin to you know, the European Union, um, which would afford us sort of a framework for discussing uh, both uh, formal and informal markets, um, both the, um, the, um, you know, the industrial sector sectors, but also the subsistence sector, and, and then we would have a forum for, for looking at uh, the impacts of, of different stakeholders and the different, the different interests. Um, so I think that was, uh, that was an important point as well. Um, and then, the, um, then uh, having looked sort of uh, more at the long-term vision of, of federations and, and unions, <laughs> we, uh, we, we agreed to that maybe we need to go back to looking more at, at the short term uh, because the reality is that uh, the change is happening uh, very quickly um, and we need to find solutions. So we need to find, find out how to beef up this responsibility factor uh, in the Arctic. So we went back to looking at the community level and uh, one of our, our participants uh, spoke about the need to empower our communities so that they can take on problems that are, that are happening at the community level uh, we can look at what different nations are doing, uh, and of course in this context uh, um, we will also need to, to consider more in terms of uh, making available or increase the accessibility at the community level to education and training, and I think that was what um, Mary Simon was uh, speaking about uh, at a panel earlier uh, this week as well. Um, then we also briefly noted the and the need to um, to to uh, review uh, or, or or to to analyze uh, monitoring um, find ways of increasing our knowledge uh, and database on the Arctic because it's difficult to properly assess risks when we are lacking knowledge um, and also the importance of uh, studying consultation processes and indigenous rights um, as just additional elements. Um, uh, then, uh, and things are maybe a little fragmented here towards the end, um, uh, then the, we, we return to the discussion of tourism, <laughs> uh, and uh, the proposal was made that, that maybe the Arctic Council could, could look at, at developing a business model um, uh, for tourism, since that seems to be an area that is somewhat undeveloped in terms of of the regulations uh, and the impact of the increase in, in cruise, cruise uh, tourism in the Arctic. Um, and then uh, also finally it, uh, suggestions were made uh, to uh, do risk assessments that are specific uh, to regions throughout the Arctic. Um, and uh, here uh, as, uh, a suggestion was made to maybe um, uh, look at what PEMA is doing in terms of mapping the Barents Sea, um, the sensitive areas of the Barents Sea, and to increase their methodology or their study um, to other uh, areas of the Arctic. Um, so I think these are, are the ones that we really um, we sort of focused in on, uh, and just to. Um, uh, and just uh, finally, you know, we, we were trying to. To, um, to condense it, uh, so some of the points are uh, that we need industry at the table at the level of the Arctic Council. Uh, we, we need to have a workshop with industry. <laughs> we need uh, better consultation processes and maybe a study or review of uh, consultation processes in the Arctic. 
Uh, and then the, uh, the final uh, suggestion that was made, just as we saw the, the clock uh, was hitting half past, that we uh, need more vigorous integration of science into regional and national um, uh, decision making. I think that was my point. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, I am going to let the idea of an Arctic Union incubate for a little bit. Um, it may not appear in the final report um, because I think that Ambassador Vasiliev would uh, uh, be very mad at me. <laughs> um, but I uh, certainly in, in, encourage this dialogue to take place uh, in a broader sense. Um, so there, there's always one chair who uh, goes above and beyond the call of duty, um, not that the others didn't, but uh, uh, Bjorn, of course, has presented a, uh, a PowerPoint for you. Um, so this, uh, this next report out uh, uh, on resilience uh, will, will highlight some of the key findings from that discussion. Bjorn? I'm, I'm not certain about over and beyond. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have the format if you don't have the content. But uh, <laughs> this time I don't speak for myself. I speak for a very, very active group that we had. <laughs> and I was totally exhausted when I went out. <laughs> so I reminded the group that we met, most of us met uh, Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And we sort of glanced through the program to, to see where, where were the surprises and where, were, where, where did we get our thoughts on, on the future, future Arctic? And we are attending a conference on the Arctic with an energy perspective. And in our group, we were invited to look via the resilience window on Arctic and energy. And then it all began. <laughs> So I, I presented a definition of resilience that is used in a um, project that is endorsed or supported by the Arctic Council, and the project is called Arctic Resilience Report. And it's led uh, from, Swede, from Sweden, from Stockholm University and Arctic, uh, Resilience Center and Stockholm Environment Institute. And they've, they've um, recently delivered a midterm report, so I, I stole the definition, what is resilience, and here it all started. So we could have stopped here and, uh, uh, and, and just let the discussion go when presenting a definition of resilience. And I, I interpret that in, in several ways. One way is that the, the, the meaning of resilience and, or the word resilience has not landed yet and is not mature. <laughs> there are different perspectives. I hope, I hope it's not a hype word that will disappear. Um, I hope it could be, could be useful. But the way the, the, this project defines resilience, you can read it here. I won't read it for you. And, the, and, the, and in, the, in this report, I, I showed a more graphic definition a way of, of using graphics to, to try to explain what we mean with a resilient system. It's, it's a question of valleys and peaks and, and a ball is moving in the valley and if it's a very deep valley, it, that system has a very large resilience because it, much is needed to go over the peak into next valley. And then we had a very fruitful discuss, discussion do we always want to stay in the valley? No, because the other valley could be more like a paradise than this valley. So you, you, need, to, you need to be very clear if you have a resilience in a system that you would like to stay in. That was one conclusion we had. And then, and then uh, the word resilience, if you, if you make an analysis of how often it uh, pops up together with the word Arctic, you can see a huge increase. <laughs> but look at the absolute numbers. The absolute numbers are not that impressive. So a warning signal, we have not yet landed when it comes to using the, 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 the word resilience. 
And we, we went back to the, the three R's that you organizers use for this um, um, uh, meeting. And I heard, Nils, uh, the, you made an equation of this, and we picked that up in our group, and that is that, that uh, richness plus responsibility equals uh, resilience. And I, I, I introduced a personal way of looking at the three R's. Richness is what we have or what we could have. And resilience, in a way, is setting the rules. Uh, and responsibility, that is what we choose to do in the Arctic. Uh, I, I think the, this way of looking at it in, in your equation is not totally two different planets. Uh, and then I invited us to uh, see the receiver of our thoughts and ideas and suggestions as the Arctic Council for many reasons. One reason is that the Arctic Council is very curious of what, what really happened in, at this meeting, uh, and they are looking forward to the result from, from this meeting. So, so we said, let's try to find the three best advices to the Arctic Council on resilience aspects regarding energy issues in the Arctic. And the whole, well, the discussion really broke loose there. So we had a discussion around the definition. We decided that we talk, when we talk about energy, we include all kinds of energies, uh, not oil only, not gas only, oil, gas, renewable, hydrothermal, all kinds of energy, so we don't narrow our thinking. And then the, the word disturbances are often used, and it has a, a negative connotation dis to disturb a system. And there are positive pushes that you can apply to a system that are resilient in order to get something more, more of high quality. Um, do, do we mean resilience of communities or do we mean resilience of energy system? And we saw that there are two parallel tracks. In the end, they converge, but we mainly took the resilience of energy system, bearing in mind that it has to be resilient for all kind of communities in the Arctic. Uh, and as, as I said before, a new phase can be both wishful and worth going to, but it can also be chaotic. So we tried to find two tables, and we tried to find three advices uh, per table. And um, in a way, it became quite a beautiful logic there, we think. <laughs> Uh, our advice to the Arctic Council is to push for and uh, establish or uh, establish the processes to, to for a, um, energy development and distribution roadmap. And I, we didn't go into details what tools there are in the Arctic Council to actually push for that. And, and when there is a, a, a roadmap, uh, and it, it should be characterized by intentional and in inclusive planning, um, otherwise, it's not a high-quality roadmap. And, the, the, and it will contain, the roadmap will certainly contain a master plan for how, how uh, the survivability will uh, for, for local communi communities and communities when it comes to energy. And if we don't succeed in getting a local ownership of all the good thinking, we have not succeeded. And then uh, I've heard it before in, in other terms, and we had it in different sessions here at the conference, establishment of some s sort of financial instrument. We call it uh, First Arctic Development Bank, and then we said, hey, hang on, why don't we use the hype word resilience? So we established the Arctic Resilience Bank, and afterwards you can, you can uh, list yourself for shares in that bank. And of course, number six, we need local implementation of all, everything we, we think of via the Arctic Council. And we can, when it comes to the master plan, we even got further. This is my final uh, slide, the next slide. We got further and revised the master plan. So there, we, um, there are some, some little refinements we need to do on the master plan, but uh, we do that later today. And Whitehorse is, the SAO meeting in Whitehorse is in two weeks or something like that. And we found a skunk way to sneak that into agenda without and nobody noting, noting it and uh, to have a decision on this, uh, uh, this master plan in two weeks. So uh, I think we have to move quite fast there. So this was the result from the uh, uh, resilience group.
thank you, Bjorn. I, I definitely owe you a beer. Um, so, <laughs> Jen, I owe you a beer too. I owe lots of people beers coming out of this uh, summit. Um, mostly, I, I owe you a, a deep debt of gratitude, uh, all of you, for, for participating, for, for actively engaging with one another. Um, uh, we've had so many excellent uh, volunteers, session chairs, uh, speakers, um, that I, I really couldn't ask for, for a better group uh, to bring together here in Akrary. Also couldn't uh, ask for a, a better location than Akrary. Um, thank you for the, the closing uh, uh, comments from each of the uh, three thematic groups, richness, res responsibility, and resilience. Um, our hope is to take the, the findings, or what we will do, is, is take the findings that, that you have provided and, and the uh, uh, gems that are embedded in the notes uh, from three days of discussions uh, and communicate those uh, to uh, SDWG uh, in the next uh, two weeks when they meet in Whitehorse. Um, and, and from there, uh, we do hope that, that, that what you've done these past three days gets taken up. Uh, you know, I heard uh, from Richness uh, an idea to map uh, renewable resources um, and develop uh, metrics for evaluation. And uh, certainly President Grimson challenged us at the beginning of the summit uh, to be not only a model for cooperation, uh, but that the Arctic could be a model for clean energy um, and maybe something uh, like mapping of those resources uh, might get us there. I heard from responsibility uh, the need to compare regulatory and con uh, consultation systems uh, to better understand how we involve local communities um, in the development of resources and, and how uh, different levels of governance are approaching uh, that development. Um, and finally, from resilience, uh, the development uh, or need to develop a, a roadmap uh, for both planning and implementation. Uh, but I like that they, they talked about the distribution of energy to communities and, and really that, that that's a, a starting point, um, uh, balancing not only uh, resilient energy systems uh, but uh, uh, resilient communities and, and that, that uh, converges. So I think there's a lot of meat uh, that we have to deliver. Um, and we'll put some uh, uh, continued, some flesh around that. Um, at the same time, we will be sure to deliver back to you uh, the uh, presentations and attendee list, uh, the video, um, and the final draft when uh, we produce it. Um, I'm going to do some more thank yous a little bit later um, and, and do some closing out of my own.